My pleasure this afternoon to introduce uh, Dr. Ezra Wogel, Henry Ford, second professor of the social sciences, emeritus at Harvard University, as the speaker for our colloquium this afternoon. Professor Wogel is perhaps the most prominent scholar and educator of East Asia in the United States and around the world. He has written extensively on East Asian affairs and U.S. East Asia relations. With the publication of his uh, most recent and also monu monumental work, Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China in 2011, and its Chinese translation in 2013, Deng Xiaoping's Shidai. Professor Wogel is perhaps the best known Western scholar in the world's most populous nation. Professor Bogo is a liberal arts person. He graduated from Ohio Wesley in 1950 and remains on Ohio Wesley's board of directors today. In the 1970s and the 1980s, Professor Bogo served as director of the undergraduate concentration in East Asian studies at Harvard. And as an educator, he has mentored generations of students of East Asia at all levels. In 1972, Professor Vogel succeeded the legendary John Fairbank to become the second director of Harvard's East Asian Research Center and later second chairman of the Council for East Asian Studies. From 1995 to 1999, he served as director of the Fairbank Center at Harvard. In 1983, Professor Vogel was invited by Lindenberg University as the convocation speaker and receive an honorary degree Doctor of Letters from us. 30 years later in 2013, I met Professor Wogo in southern China during one of his book tours. I invited Professor Wogo to come back to Windenburg and he immediately accepted our invitation. In the new millennium, Professor Wogo continues his active engagement with the scholarly and the policy communities in both the US and East Asia, which is perhaps the most dynamic and also the most dangerous place in the world. With that, let's welcome Professor Bogo to share with us his thoughts about Deng Xiaoping and the current Chinese leader, Xi Jinping. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's really uh, nice to be back in Ohio and back at Wittenberg. And I very much appreciate uh, Professor Dinu's uh, uh, introduction. And I'm very happy to see my old friend, uh, Gene Swinger, uh, whom I know even before, I, long before I got my undergraduate degree at Wittenberg. And he's an old friend. And I think he's been retired so long. Listen, we haven't had the privilege of studying under him. We've had the privilege of studying under uh, you. Now, since I have spent uh, uh, over 10 years doing the work on Deng Xiaoping, I thought I'd start with uh, showing a few pictures of Deng Xiaoping and uh, give kind of the background because when he asked me to talk about the present leader, I see him in the context of what Deng Xiaoping did. Now, Deng Xiaoping <coughs> came to power in 1978. In 1978, China was really terrible mess, uh, over a billion people, and they've gone through the Great Leap Forward, the Great Leap Forward announcement that 30, 40 million people died of hunger. And then that was followed by 10 years of the Cultural Revolution, and Professor Yubin uh, went to work and uh, joined the army uh, in China. Uh, and at that time, uh, the country was in absolute turmoil. And you can imagine, say, the United States after the Civil War, trying to put the country back together in the Civil War. And uh, the impact of the Cultural Revolution was something like a Civil War, except it was worse, because you had people in the same unit who had been on the fighting sides, and people were killed and tortured and burned, uh, and accused and suffered, and the children suffered. And uh, to have those people uh, try to come to terms with each other in 1978 when came to power uh, was really some uh, difficult task. And then the country had been so full of Maoist ideology and uh, communes that were 
working and where they've been close to the outside world and didn't have enough funds really to invest in modern industry. And so the country was in one terrible mess. <clears throat> so to think of a country, some people have estimated the average per capita income was less than $100 per capita uh, when he came to power in 1978. And now uh, you look at China and the economy has already passed Japan's in size. And depending on when you count it, how you count it, will probably surpass American size. Of course, the population of 1.3 billion, or almost 1.4 billion, uh, the per capita income is not nearly as great as it is in the United States or even Japan. But uh, if you say, what is the overall power of the country, it's really tremendous. So the guy that put this, or led the country uh, back together, uh, and this changing pace, changing way of getting, uh, going about things, opening up to the uh, Western world in a wider way, bringing in industry uh, with Deng Xiaoping. Uh, a little guy, five feet tall, uh, but really quite amazing. I, I have a lot of pictures, I'll just run to give you a sense of what this guy uh, was like. Uh, here he is at age 16 uh, when he went to France in 1912. <clears throat> and uh, uh, right after 1895, at the sign of the Japanese War, quite a few uh, Chinese went to Japan. And now, of course, we have close to 300,000 studying in the United States. But 1920, probably the most uh, popular country to go to was France. Uh, and it was thought of as a major civilization. And during World War I, quite a few Chinese workers had gone to France. So a lot of Chinese leaders had the idea, well, why don't we send the students to France and they can work part time. Even the rich people in China didn't have enough money to pay their tuition abroad. And so they thought they worked part time and study part time. Uh, so that was done at age 16, one of those selected very talented people. Uh, here he is with a group of uh, young communist uh, Congress in France. And this is to show uh, that a lot of people who were in that group later became leaders in China. I guess we have a picture of both sides here. Uh, right in the middle is Zhou Enlai, who became premier, and Mao's right-hand man, and uh, was the foreign minister, and the person who met Kissinger. And here he is as a youth. Uh, and way over to the left is a man named Yerong Zhen, the general, later general, and really led the scientific the technological development of China later on. Uh, and oh, just to, to your, our right, uh, looking at uh, John Lai, you see Yi Ku Chun, who later really led the first five year plan. And way in the back there is Deng Xiaoping. Now they had to dress up for this picture, but they were really uh, worker clothes. And I, what this shows is from that little group of communists, there are an awful lot of people who later assumed uh, very prominent positions. Unfortunately, they didn't have a chance to uh, study much. They didn't, they didn't have enough money. And it turned out that uh, when they got there, uh, even the jobs in the factories weren't so good. The, the French uh, soldiers who survived World War I were coming back to work. And so when they planned these programs, they thought there would be a real labor shortage. But by this time, it wasn't. And so they got very little wages. And so they really had to end up working full time. But Dunn was there five years and really got a sense of what life was like in the foreign country. Now we're going to skip way back up into the 1950s, 1949, of course, uh, China uh, communist government takes over. And this is to show that Deng Xiaoping uh, was already quite close to now. Here they are uh, when they visit Moscow in 1957. Uh, and I'm um, here uh, with uh, Mao. Uh, you know, in, we, in the United States, when we elect a president, if we don't elect some foolish guy who did one thing or another, we very often elect somebody who was formerly a governor or somebody uh, who had been in Congress. If they were a governor, they've had experience in local administration. If they've been in Congress, they know more about national policy and international policy. Well, Dung is one of those who had both those experiences. In 49 to 52, he was in charge of the whole southwest of China. And, <clears throat> and after 1952, he went to Beijing. So from 52 uh, to 50 to 66 uh, in the Cultural Revolution, 
he was one of the leaders uh, in Beijing. Because he had been so close to Mao, he'd already known John Lai as a youth in that picture I showed you before. And here he is uh, with Moscow in 1957. Uh, and, and, with, uh, and here he is, he met Khrushchev in 1960. He was also there in Moscow, it happened, so he had a lot of experience in foreign policy. In 1956, he was in Moscow when Khrushchev uh, denounced Stalin, and he could see the terrific impact this had, because Stalin had so much close relations with so many leaders that all those who were close to Stalin suffered, and the party was just driven, uh, split wide open because of that. And he was determined from that lesson that if China ever uh, had succession, no matter how much you dislike the leader, you can't have that kind of denunciation of the leader. You just have too many people who work with it. And so later on, when uh, Mao died, uh, he told, chose a very different path. He also had relations with a lot of other people. Here he is with Ho Chi Minh. It happened that Ho Chi Minh was in France at the same time he was. And although they were not friends at that time, they, they knew each other were, and so when he became leader of Vietnam. So he had quite a range of contact in this early period with people from the third world. Uh, and they were fellow revolutionaries in those days. Uh, in 1977, uh, uh, sorry, 1979, uh, Dung uh, led a, an attack on Vietnam. But in these days, they were all fellow revolutionaries uh, fighting the imperialists. Um, and uh, let's see, we're right here. Uh, here we are when he's off to Moscow in 1963. Here he is with Deng Xiaoqi, another leader, John. I just bought many of them, John. Uh, they were off to Moscow. Uh, Dunn was five feet tall, but if you look at him, you don't think that he has an inferiority complex because of his size. Very confident guy. Uh, Um, now, uh, Dung uh, got into trouble. Mao was very tough when people didn't follow him very closely. And uh, Dung had already suffered once uh, way back at, before 1949. And after 1949, he was twice sent down. Uh, once was in the Cultural Revolution in 1966, where he was considered a very big enemy. And uh, so he had suffered from 60. 6 to 73, and then uh, he suffered again from 76 until he came back at the end of 78. Uh, but uh, here is the first time he came back in May 1973. Uh, came back into office, and it's just as if everything is uh, normal and he's back to work. Uh, but one of my colleagues at Harvard, David Gergen, said his leadership. And uh, what he said is a lot of the interesting world leaders They've had an experience where they were in a high position, then they lose out, and then they come back later. And the experience of having been in the wilderness gives you an opportunity to think things over and have broad perspective. When you're in the office and just continue, you're so busy with things, you don't have that perspective. And uh, Lincoln was one of those who had a high position and got kicked out and came back. Uh, De Gaulle was, had some of Churchill was that experience. Uh, and I think Dung also had that same experience. So from uh, the time he went down uh, to the countryside in, in uh, the early uh, 1970s, uh, until he came back in 73, he was there, I'm sorry, 69 he went down. So three and a half years, he was down in the province of Tennessee in a fairly uh, rural area. He worked half day in a, in a factory I hear he was already a great leader, but it gave him a chance to get perspective and think what's the really important thing he wants to do when he comes back to power. Maybe, maybe I can just work, work it over here. I can stay there if you want me to. No, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Uh, to, to one on the right, right? Yeah. So, uh, in 1974, it was a thanks. Uh, it was expected that uh, Zhou Enlai would go up to the UN. It, China had, had been uh, not given a seat in the UN. It was Taiwan that took the seat. 
until 1971. And so after that, they wanted the Chinese leader to go represent the nation at the United Nations. So the very first person they thought of going was John Lai. And John Lai by 1974 had cancer, so he couldn't go. So Deng was selected by Mao uh, to go and give the first speech for the China and the United Nations there. Deng was giving that speech. Uh, here he is at the head of the table. Um, and that's the first time he met Kissinger. Kissinger uh, had met John Lai several years earlier and uh, had uh, met Nixon when Nixon went to China in 1972. But when they first met, uh, that's Chavo Ma, the foreign minister on the left. And uh, there they are being friendly. But I, when I talked to Kissinger about this visit, uh, he said that, he, that Dung was not as experienced and as smooth as uh, John Lai had been. Uh, but but uh, he, was, he said he was still on a learning trip. And so he was kind of getting training. But there they are. So that was his first uh, visit to the United States. Now, then, as I said, in 1976, when uh, Mao was on his last legs, he selected his successor, not Dung. A lot of people thought Dung was going to be the successor. In some ways, he had been cultivated and trained to take that position. But he didn't take that position. And so in 1976, after he died, uh, he was out of office. Wago Fung was going to be the future leader. And then he came back in. Uh, 1977 in the summer, and he volunteered for the job of being in charge of education, science, and technology. It was partly because he didn't want to challenge the political leadership of Bok Le Fung, uh, and it's also because he really needed that support. If China's going to move ahead for the new era when they can industrialize to be a modern country, we need to think education. Now, all during the Cultural Revolution, the universities did not have their regular entrance examinations. And uh, it was only when the universities opened in 1977, thanks to Deng Xiaoping, that they started up the entrance examinations. So a lot of the youth during the Cultural Revolution had been sent down to the countryside. And uh, so they did have uh, universities for soldiers and farmers and, and army people, theoretically. But they weren't as high quality. They didn't have regular university functioning all during that period of Cultural Revolution. So Deng Xiaoping said one of the first things he wants to do, this has been days after he came back to work, he wanted to have a meeting of all the people in the education field to discuss where they go. And entrance examinations were a very important part of that. Uh, and one of the things he wanted to do was get up to the world levels in science. At that time, one of the advantages that China had was that there had been several Chinese who had gone to the West to study and had been very successful. In the United States at that time, there were three uh, Chinese Americans who had won the Nobel Prize. One of them was Yang Jianing, uh, one of them was Samuel Ding, MIT, uh, and one of them was Yi Chen Dao from Columbia. And Deng had long talks with every one of those. And he went to see, he saw them very often. And what he was interested in is what has China got to do to catch up in science and technology? Because for a country to modernize, education is just very basic. Uh, here he is uh, with another famous uh, Chinese educator, uh, Jia Yanren. Uh, the reason I show that picture is uh, Jia Yanren's daughter is on the right. Uh, her name was Iris Bien. And she was the Chinese teacher at Harvard in the Chinese language, and I suffered through her in first year Chinese. <laughs> she was tough. Um, you know, the Japanese uh, in, 19, um, in, in 1871 sent a huge mission uh, overseas, the Iwakura mission, to learn about the West. So when they came back, uh, that was a very important basis for how they thought about modernization, what they had to do to catch up. And uh, China didn't have anything quite as big, but the closest thing they had to that was a mission that they were sending in several, 78 after Mao died. They were starting to send missions out. And the biggest and most important mission was the one led by Gu Mu. And they sent it off to, to Europe. And here is that delegation going off to Europe, I think it was five to six weeks, 
a trip and they observed factories and schools and mines and farms and experimental stations, universities. And so they came back and that, the people they selected were high up in the various ministries who would play a role in modernization and might be a U mission that provided a good base uh, for growth. And here Dunn is talking to the leader of that delegation. <clears throat> now, uh, as I said, Olga Flynn was the successor chosen uh, to be, by Mao, to be his successor. But by the middle of 1978, there were a lot of officials who felt that Olga Flynn was not a strong enough leader. He had no international experience. Uh, he didn't have the experience of dealing with science and technology, all kinds of foreign policy. He had almost no experience. And although uh, he was a forward-looking person who wanted to make some changes for the Mao's era, his position came because he was Mao's successor. That was the real basis of his selection. Uh, and they felt that when they needed a strong leader, a lot of high-level party leader, uh, leaders felt they needed a strong leader who could lead the country in a new direction, and Wagga Fung was not that strong a person. So they had a central party work conference uh, before a plenum when they had the formal meeting, and they were discussing about where they would want to go. Ordinarily, they only take several weeks, but here's one that went on six weeks. And these delegates, two years after the Agriculture Revolution, decided they wanted a stronger leader, and they wanted to move ahead more vigorously, and they chose Deng Xiaoping. Uh, to become the head. And Deng Xiaoping himself didn't know that was going to happen. And here they are at the plenum, the two people who were selected to be the leaders of China after uh, the third plenum. Uh, Chen Yun, who had had a lot of experience uh, in economic leadership uh, and in party organizational leadership, uh, and Deng Xiaoping, the two of them. And I think a lot of uh, high-level leaders felt that Mao had run things too much in his own hands, and that when errors and problems occurred, there were not enough people to stop them. And they felt that it done what they knew that Dung was a very strong forward leader, and they wanted somebody to be able to balance it. And Chen Yun was the other senior member of the party who had comparable experience, whose membership in the poll here went back even before Dung's. And so the two of them were selected to be the leaders. <clears throat> um, in Chinese history with Japan, a couple thousand years of history, um, the first time any Chinese leader met the emperor of Japan uh, was uh, October 1978. It was Deng Xiaoping when he went to meet the emperor. And here Deng and his wife, uh, Zhuo Lin, are with the emperor and empress of Japan. And there was kind of an abbreviated apology and Deng accepted that apology, and Deng said, we need to begin to work together, the two of our countries, and he was laying the basis for that. While he was in Japan, he visited several modern places uh, that he thought were going to be very important uh, for Chinese economic development. One of the places he visited was Kimitsu Steel Plant, one of the most modern steel plants in the world, and that became the model for China's first modern steel plant in Shanghai, the Baoshan plant. Um, the first uh, time that any Chinese leader rode on a fast train uh, was the bullet train from Tokyo to Kyoto, and here we are, done with his interpreter, uh, in the first time a Chinese leader rides on a fast train. As you know, China now has far more uh, mileage of fast trains than any other country in the world, and I personally find it embarrassing that we in the United States don't yet have any fast train. Uh, China and Japan's first fast train was 1964. Uh, this is already over a decade later, uh, and the United States still doesn't have, but uh, China has, uh, I forgot what the latest figures are, but some close to 20,000 miles of fast trains. Deng uh, uh, felt that uh, you have to thank the people who helped Chinese relations with Japan. And uh, there's a famous Chinese expression, uh, when you drink from the well, you ought to be thankful to the people who built the well. And uh, the person who built the well of Sino Japanese relations, one of them, was Tanaka Kakue. Kakue uh, Tanaka was in trouble in those days uh, because of the Lockheed scandal. 
Uh, but now you insisted on the sea. You went to visiting visiting uh, one year in Singapore. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when Nixon visited uh, China, they did not yet normalize relations. It took a few years. And uh, everybody, a lot of people were wondering why it was so slow. And in the May 1978, uh, President Carter felt they were ready to move ahead with, and he sent this big Krasinski uh, to meet them in May 78, and they decided to move ahead with normalizations. And they selected for the American representative in Beijing, uh, uh, Leonard Woodcock. And Leonard Woodcock uh, was a labor negotiator. And Carter selected him partly because they figured he was a good negotiator. And he also had the reputation for being very honest for being respected not only by the labor union which he represented, but also with management. And he felt that here was a man who would be a very honest, good negotiator. So for a series of negotiations in the fall of 1978, they discuss uh, normalization. Right in the middle of the guy with the teeth, that's Huang Hua, uh, the Chinese uh, foreign minister. Uh, and there they are uh, celebrating the completion of those talks for normalization in December 1978. And so in January 1979, Dunn comes to uh, the United States. The guy in the middle is an interpreter named Ji Chao Zhu, uh, the guy I've got to know pretty well, because it turns out that he had been at Harvard. Uh, his father had been a Chinese American newspaper guy, had left this newspaper in New York. And so he had a lot of years in the United States, and including two or three years at Harvard. He went back in 1950 and was trained as an interpreter and he has a great sense of humor, and was uh, Dung's interpreter. So here they are uh, having a good, good time. Xi uh, uh, told me that one of the hardest things in interpreting for Dung uh, was he had to bend over him constantly. He was about a head taller than Dung. Uh, but here they are having a good time. Here they are at the White House. Uh, here they are signing the normalization agreement. Uh, now, just as he wanted Tanaka Kakue to come back, he said the guy who built the well for a Chinese American and better relations in the United States was Nixon. Uh, Nixon was a bit of trouble after the White, white uh, Watergate scandal, but he said he hoped that he would be allowed to come to the White House. So the first time after Nixon left the office to come back to the White House was when Deng Xiaoping insisted that he come. Carter said, okay, and there they are at the White House with Nixon and Carter. Uh, first time Nixon's in the White House here. Um, we in Massachusetts are very proud, proud of Tip O'Neill, who was our congressman. The man said all politics is local. Um, and uh, he met uh, Tip O'Neill and had a long talk. And Tip O'Neill briefed him on uh, how Congress and the White House go along. Uh, in the United States, it's, you know, sometimes we fight with the president. Sometimes we make a lot of mistakes with the White House. We have to tell them what to do. And so uh, it's a lot of trouble, but in the long run, we think a democracy works pretty well because we have checks and balances. And so if the president tries to go any place, we can uh, tell him, you know, he has to shape up. And uh, Dunn listened very carefully. And at the end, he said, we work in China. He felt they had much better centralized leadership and didn't need to have that kind of split leadership. Uh, he took a trip around the United States. Um, when he was in Houston, uh, at the rodeo, a lady rode up and gave him a hat, and immediately put on the hat. And uh, that picture became a great symbol, both in the United States and China. In the, in the United States, it became a symbol, uh, hey, those Chinese, maybe they're a bunch of communists, but somehow, a guy like that, we ought to be able to work with them. But even more, I think, in China, uh, American until that time, it wasn't America, the, the word wasn't America. It was Mei Wati uh, American imperialists. And uh, so, hey, if we can have that much fun in the United States, maybe America isn't so bad. Maybe there's some things we can learn from the United States. Uh, here he is at the Space Center. Uh, <clears throat> here he is getting business going in Beijing. Uh, here he is with uh, George Bush Sr. It happened that when George Bush Sr. had been in charge of the liaison office in Beijing in 1970. Before, uh, uh, Dung was in uh, charge at that time. And so they had very close relations already in Beijing. 
And so <clears throat> uh, here he is, Reagan. So you see, he has been able to get along with Democrats and Republicans and uh, party members. Here he is uh, discussing with Thatcher, the future of Hong Kong. Uh, she towers over him. Uh, and here he is with the President of the World Bank. One of the things that Dung um, felt was that um, to have membership in international organizations forces you to abide by international standards, and that would be helpful uh, to uh, China not only to take part in those activities, to get advice, and to help push reforms with inside uh, China. In the same way with the IMF. Um, <clears throat> Frank Dibney, uh, I don't know if that's why you're Dibney, because he spent a lot of time in Japan, over by Japan. But uh, Dunn felt that in those days, before they had Wikipedia, that uh, he didn't know what Wikipedia was, he never did. Uh, but that one way to introduce foreign culture was through the Encyclopedia Britannica. So if you got that available in China, uh, in Chinese, it would be open up understanding the outside world. Here he is meeting with various, various businessmen, uh, Henry Clark. Uh, uh, here he is with a billionaire from Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, and Wang in 1986, Wang Wan was a major computer company, and by having a Chinese American in the computer business, it was a quite quick way of learning what IT was like to become. And so he would get briefed about what China needed to do. Uh, here he is with Bush, and uh, the interpreter in those days is Yang Jiechi, who was later ambassador, uh, foreign minister, and now state counselor. Uh, here he is with. Uh, Gorbachev in the spring of 1989. In the spring of 1989, when Gorbachev came, he invited a lot of foreign press. But when the foreign press got there, they found the most interesting thing was the student movement. And they had huge uh, movements at Tiananmen. Here we are, the goddess of democracy. Uh, and here we are, the tanks rolling in, uh, putting down the student movement. And there were several hundred people who were killed as the foreign press, as the foreign, as, uh, Chinese troops took over. And uh, that experience, a decision to send in troops was something Dung decided. They had sent in unarmed troops on May 20th, a few weeks before, and they hadn't been able to keep order. And he felt that it, while it was not a good thing to do, uh, there was no other choice but to put down the movement. And the way to put down the movement was send in the troops and the people. He warned the people not to block, but if they did, the army was told to do what's necessary to restore order. They did. So learned people were killed, and the relations with a lot of foreign countries became very bad. And for many people, this was a mar on Deng Xiaoping's record. Some Chinese felt that he did what he had to do, and it was not a pleasant thing to do, but it enabled the country to stay together. Uh, Bush Sr. was president, but had had good relations with Deng, and immediately sent uh, Red Scowcroft because he felt it was very important relations between the two countries. So after Tiananmen, uh, Deng tried to, to say to the world, we should, Chinese should stay calm. He told his people, don't get too excited. Foreign countries don't have very long memories. In a few years, they will want to come back to our market. And uh, so don't get too excited. Uh, and uh, 1992, he's 88 years old. He passes the uh, uh, torch to his successor, John Zinn. Uh, here he is waiting to fly the political stage, 1992. After that, uh, he's an old man walking around. He was born in 1904, so here he is, 88 years old, uh, finally leaving the political stage, uh, walking around his garden. Uh, when he died in 1997, uh, there is the Chinese uh, his, uh, service. Uh, and uh, here we are, uh, John Zemin with his memorial talk. And even the UN Security Council, uh, which had welcomed him to give the first choice trips to China, had a special moment of silence uh, to celebrate his death. So that's been something that's what I worked on. Now I'll go for about 10 more minutes on Xi Jinping and how Xi Jinping looks to somebody who comes out of the dump. Uh, <clears throat> to somebody who's worked on dumb, to see the extraordinary experience and dream that he had. He had experience as a local leader. He had experience in the Army. I didn't mention the Army. For 12 years, he was in the Army and 
was the front uh, commissar in the Kwai Hai campaign, perhaps the biggest campaign during the war, 500,000 troops uh, that he was the uh, commissar for. So he emerged as a military hero. So he had uh, five years in, in uh, France, one year in the Soviet Union. He had two or three years in which he worked with Joe and Lai in managing foreign relations with the country. He had 10 years as general party secretary, uh, and as I say, three years in charge of the Southwest. Uh, so he, nearly all the major leaders in all parts of the country he worked <laughs> under him. He knew where they were, he knew where the, uh, like Lyndon Johnson, knew where the bodies were buried. And he knew how to accomplish things. The Xi Jinping comes from a family that uh, as an old revolutionary, his father was a vice uh, foreign minister, uh, vice premier, and uh, at a very high level. And so what the Chinese call Hong Kong guy, uh, the, the second generation of sort of red leaders. Uh, so he's well connected. But he came uh, to power during the Cultural Revolution. And so I mean, he came to education during the Cultural Revolution. So he did not have a good educational experience uh, Experience of a lot of courses. And by the time he got through uh, with the Cultural Revolution, <clears throat> the period 1979 to 82, I think was a very important period for a lot of young Chinese because the world suddenly opened up and they had kind of open, free discussions of all kinds of issues about the whole world. But during that time, uh, Xi Jinping was a secretary uh, to uh, the, uh, a leader in the army. And uh, because he was uh, a leadership uh, in, in the army at that time, he didn't have, he didn't really take part in that broader ferment that was taking place in the whole society. So then, after after that time, <coughs> his experience is overwhelmed. Well, in the, in the regions, he didn't really have experience <coughs> in the leadership position in Beijing. So here you have a guy who knows how to manage local politics. I uh, had been in Fujian and Jiangxi and Shanghai, uh, and as a youth, had been in the Northwest. But he, 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 his family had been in Beijing. He'd been there probably as a kid. But he never worked in Beijing. He didn't have that experience. So uh, in the United States, it'd be like somebody coming from outside the Beltway uh, who had absolutely no experience in Washington politics. And so he didn't have any of that sure-footed experience. So from my take, this meant that Xi Jinping uh, did not have sort of the depth of experience and confidence in issues like foreign policy, in my view. He was kind of like an apprentice in training, or somebody in taking office without that kind of depth of background and understanding. Um, when he came to power, the two leaders before him, Jiang Zemin and uh, Hu Jintao, I think you can compare them somewhat uh, to uh, bureaucrats who suddenly rise up to a higher position. That is, people who knew the details, who worked administratively, but they've been involved in the rough and tumble of real tough politics. And so when I think that a lot of people at the high levels thinking who they're going to select as a new leader, they wanted somebody who could manage those politics, who had more confidence, who didn't have that kind of administrative structure, who, who, who had a lot of confidence, who had a lot of friends and contacts. And so I think that's part of the reason Xi Jinping got picked. And by the time he came to power, I think China had a lot of new problems. Dung, Dung had one kind of problem, so how you get a country change direction completely, a poor country that started on the path. And once you begin to get the path of growth, the growth feeds on uh, popularity and support, and so people could move quite ahead. But the time uh, she's been painting in power, the country is beginning to level off, and the country is not going to have a lower growth rate. So you have to adjust to lower expectations. You don't have that going for you. Also, by now, corruption is a really big issue, and a lot of popular people throughout the country they look at those high-level people. Uh, it almost reminds you in the United States how we feel about those billionaires who milk the country uh, and often don't pay taxes and have a lot of things. While a lot of working-class people have trouble making income, some have good jobs. 
So I think that kind of popular sentiment in China meant that the leader had to really crack down on corruption. And so Xi Jinping has really done that. And I think he's uh, accomplished a lot. And when I go around China talking to was uh, about six weeks I spent in China last October and November, and as I talked to people, I think the general feeling was that in terms of crackdown and corruption, he given very high marks. And a lot of people in China feel they need a strong leader now to deal with those problems of corruption. But they got a lot of other problems, too. Um, you know, it reminds me when I was a kid in Ohio, uh, a lot of the welfare was family welfare or community welfare. But by the 1930s, so many people were moving from one place to another. We had to have a national system. So Roosevelt really introduced a national system of central welfare. Well, China isn't just in that transition now. We're trying to get a, a national welfare system for health uh, and a national welfare system for Social Security, retirement, and so forth. Takes a lot of money, a lot of planning, a lot of transition. And um, one of the problems that you have when you crack down on corruption is that the guys now who have been uh, making a lot of decisions are worried that they might get caught next time. So one of the problems in China now is that a lot of the high-level officials are afraid they might make a mistake. So it used to be a foreign company or a local company that wanted to get a deal fixed and go to the fixer at the local political station and got it fixed. Now the guy said, mm -hmm. No, it's, it's better not to do anything than to make a mistake. Uh, if you don't do anything, you're not likely to get much trouble. But if you make a deal, you know, you might be accused of corruption. So a lot of things are not happening very well. So you've got a leader now who has those kind of problems. It's a strong leader, very confident, centralized power, uh, runs around the world making friends. China now has a lot more power than it did in Deng's age. And a leader who's ready to be much stronger dealing the outside world. So you have really quite a different picture, new kinds of problems, a strong leader with less experience, but he's got to deal with those problems. Uh, well, that being enough, we'll see how it started for the question. <coughs> Thank you very much. Japanese language even, I think. Uh, and also, uh, two, three years ago, you published a, a book about uh, South Korean leader, Park Chung-hee, the Park chung era, the transformation of uh, South Korea. So Professor Vogel indeed is a, a real East Asianist and covering all these major cultures, uh, and also their uh, uh, relationship between China, Japan, and Korea. So, those questions can also be, you know, go beyond China and go uh, back. So let's have the Johnson here, Jennifer. You, uh, t you talked about Dung's interest in science and technology when he uh, came back to power. And I wondered if that is something that he had been interested in all the way along. He'd always been pushing at, at all the different stages at which he had power. Or is that something that, it sounded almost you were describing sabbaticals when he was sent down, and was that something that came to mind in some of those downtimes, or is that something he always stressed? I know the science and technology or science and uh, uh, democracy were so important in the 20s, you know, Mr. Science, Mr. Democracy. Was that something that he imbibed then, or was it later? Well, your last comment, I think, is right on. That's, that's what I would say, is that he came to adulthood at the time when uh, Chinese nationalists he was born in 1904, so 1917 you have uh, Japan's 21 demands, and then you have Versailles in 1919. And so he's 15 years old, 
So he already took to the streets as a kind of precocious demonstrator at 15 years old. And the, already at that time, uh, the 1919 Mayport movement was uh, science, Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy. So I think the idea of science and technology already was in his head. And I think part of his hope when he went to France was that he would be able to learn more about that. The disappointing thing to those Chinese students was uh, instead of learning advanced technology to bring back, they, learned, they were worked in the factory and they, they operated with technology of the day. But I think in his mind, he always knew uh, that that was not enough. And I think the, the uh, Chinese intellectuals who went abroad or thought about going abroad, they already realized, realized that China to modernize and to have uh, a uh, advanced uh, modern society needed industry, and for industry you need technology. So I think that had already been very deep and instinctive, and the kind of people he was with in that picture in France in 1924, all of them I think were among that intellectual core, like Nyerung Jun is one of his closest friends was the one who led science and technology in the military. So I think that was just very deep in his sense. So even though he himself was not a scientist and well trained, it had been very much a part of his, his uh, uh, sentiments and views ever since 1919. Was it a source of a conflict with Mao ever? His push for that? I think um, Mao had different ideas. I think Mao was very ambivalent. And um, one of the, in 1957, uh, after they had had sort of the opening of uh, new ideas and uh, uh, let flowers bloom and a lot of free discussions, Mao decided to clamp down on intellectuals. And uh, the person he put in charge of the movement to clamp down on intellectuals was Deng Xiaoping. And Deng did his job. But the way Deng behaved later, I think he regretted that very much. I mean, he, he had to follow, and he was, you know, to get ahead, he had to, to do what your leader taught. It was a very autocratic system. But I think a lot of friends and a lot of people he knew suffered in that movement. And after he came to power in 1978, they had a reversal of verdicts on a lot of those intellectuals. But he said the movement itself was not a mistake. But then I mean four or five people uh, who uh, really had committed things. Everybody else, their, their verdicts were re reversed. So I think as, as a subordinate in the party, he knew, like Joe and I, that you had to do everything the mouse said. It was a dictatorship. And he did not express different opinions. We, it's, it's hard for even a researcher like me to find anything that he said during that earlier period that was different from now. He was an obedient employee. Well, as a matter of fact, when he was in the Soviet Union, he had to write an essay. And one of the things he said in that essay is, a uh, party demands uh, discipline, and you have to be obedient. And everything that he did later was consistent with that. But when he had the power after 1978, he took the country in a different direction but he didn't do it too, too quickly. I think one of, one of his brilliances was that he did it step by step. And he praised Mao in theory and said that Mao Zedong was such a great leader. He did such a, in his later, stage, later stages, he made some mistakes. But we all make mistakes. So it was hard for the people who believed in Mao to get angry at him because he'd been such a loyal follower. He knew him so well. Uh, and yet he was beginning to depart. So much for giving us this great quote. And so I just have a question to live with Chinese economy. Um, I read your article before. It seems like you did some observation on Chinese economy. That I think uh, China right now, our economy is at the stage, this transformation that we have a high speed economic growth, which makes tremendous you know, um, economic wealth. But right now it's shifted to our relatively slow economy. Um, how do you reflect on this um, situation? Do you think that's healthy? And how does that just impact on Chinese future economy and to the extent to world economy? 
Um, most of the uh, intense work I did with the Chinese economy was in the 1980s. I was in the Guangdong province, which was the first uh, province to be allowed more freedom. And I was assigned to the economic commission of the province for about half, half a year and went around with them looking at the economy. Uh, in recent times, I haven't had that kind of in-depth. I, you know, I visit, uh, you know, some factories and stores and so forth when I go, and I try to follow the overall literature. <clears throat> I think right now uh, the, the, there are several uh, problems in the economy. One is because they had tried to encourage modernization. A lot of local party secretaries got ahead because they pushed growth. So they didn't push environmental understanding very much. And if they had a choice whether you have a factory that burns a lot of coal uh, and causes a lot of environmental problems uh, or not, they went with the factory because they wanted to have growth. And a lot of people uh, did what in the local areas what they needed to do to get growth. And a lot of local communities, the local mayors, uh, in order to make things grow, they didn't have a big tax base. So they sold land around the edges, and some of them even went in debt in order to make the place grow. So now you have a huge problem of local debt, and how do you get that repaid, and how do you get a tax basis for that? Also, you have uh, a lot of <coughs> companies uh, that <coughs> don't have as much incentive for efficiency as the private sector. They don't have to watch the budget that much. And even <coughs> a lot of the so-called private companies, in fact, are run by friends of the high political leaders. Uh, one of my friends who wrote about Russia wrote a book called the, not the privatization of Russia, the piratization of Russia, uh, by which he meant that a lot of the uh, people who were well-connected got state property. So the process of privatization often led to a lot of friends of political leaders making a lot of money and becoming very rich. And that has happened in China. So a lot of the so-called private companies are really run by friends of high-level political leaders. And that means they are not as pressured uh, for efficiency <coughs> and uh, high uh, performance as uh, open private companies. So those are part of the problems. Of, uh, and, and then also, <coughs> because wages are high, you need a big transition. So the coastal areas which have been producing goods for international markets now have to pay workers a lot more. And so those coastal factories in Guangdong and Zhejiang and Zhangzhou and so forth, they uh, now have more competition from India, Vietnam, other countries that can have cheaper wages. And a lot of those factories now have to move to the western part of China where you have lower labor costs and new transport connections will enable those local factories in the West uh, to grow. So I think those are some of the basic, of course, there are uh, economic problems they have to deal with. Uh, the higher cost of wages, how do you adjust? How do you move up to higher technology uh, in order to be more efficient to compete with the most modern countries? Uh, how do you compete? Uh, Vietnam and, and India, which have lower salaries, uh, how you handle the problem of low, low, lower debt, and how you force state companies and private companies uh, with that uh, still have political connections that are not as motivated for uh, efficiency, how you turn that around. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of those local governments are now in debt, so how do you deal with that debt problem? So to me, those are the some of the biggest uh, issues that the economy is facing now. So I want to go beyond what you just talked about today and tap into your expertise and then East Asianists in general. Um, so East Asia, we always talk about Japan, Korea, and China. Uh, but then there are these border countries like Mongolia and Vietnam that sometimes get called East Asia and sometimes get called Central Asia or Southeast Asia. And I was wondering, um, if you think of Mongolia and Vietnam as East Asia or not, and what the criteria would be for determining that, and whether it matters? Of course it matters. Uh, I'm not as uh, a specialist on Mongolia and Vietnam as 
some of the other places, I'll give you my impression. I think Mongolia, by being a pretty independent place, uh, they have a lot of people who don't necessarily kowtow to China, and they send them to the United States and Japan and wherever. And I think they are a fairly free swing uh, area, uh, very much influenced by Chinese culture, but quite a bit independent. In Vietnam, of course, uh, they had French colonialization. And so my age, Vietnamese, you know, often knew France and knew French and uh, had uh, quite a bit of European experience. And then, even though America did some terrible things in the war, and after the war, it was a very heavy Americanization. I think the Vietnamese have a very strong anti-Chinese mood uh, because they've been invaded by China over the years. 1979, Dung led an invasion of Vietnam. And um, when the, the Vietnamese think of what country they have to worry about, it's probably more China than any other. And they see that impact throughout history uh, of uh, China. Culturally, of course, a lot of uh, Chinese uh, era of Vietnamese, you know, learn Chinese. And you, you, so there, there are a lot of Vietnamese who know quite a bit about China. And they are Communist Party. So they, there is a certain kind of understanding of each other uh, between Vietnam uh, and, uh, um, and China. Uh, one of my Vietnamese friends says, if you look at the map of Vietnam, it's sort of like a person with a humpback. Why do we have a humpback? The Chinese have been sitting on us. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there is a lot of tension. So I think that uh, those countries did not have as deep a uh, impact of China and Japan. I think the Confucian culture uh, that had had such a big impact on Japan and Korea did not have that big impact on, uh, on Vietnam. And Mongols, of course, come from the horseback riding, you know, frontier kind of. I know the Texan would be a good analogy, but a uh, somewhat independent uh, group, uh, and now they, they're, they remain relatively independent. So I, I think they don't, uh, put it another way, when, uh, you know, Fairbank and his people thought of uh, the Ch written Chinese characters, Confucians and chopsticks, and that's China, Japan, Korea, but Mongolia and Vietnam are not quite like that. I think that's sort of a symbol for the fact that they're just a little more different than that. Yeah. Um, sure. uh, I have a question about Xi Jinping. Um, well, he tried really very hard to solve the very bad, very serious uh, corruption problem in China when he made the big tigers bow out. But um, at the same time, it looks like he has more, you know, bigger control. He wants to have bigger control of um, mass media, um, you know, people enjoy less freedom of speech now. And also, I, I feel that he's following Mao's example and giving, uh, you know, the um, cult of personality is getting more and more serious. Is it because, like you said, he lack of experience or maybe um, insecure, or how do you come back? Well, I think that's a very key, critical issue right now. And it's one that, you know, those of us who try to follow the current politics, we're, we're constantly asking. <coughs> when I talk to my, most of my Chinese intellectual friends in China, the impression I get is that when he first came to power, a lot of them hoped that he would move much more toward democracy, more open discussion, more freedom, because his father, uh, was really quite uh, a liberal and was a relatively reform-minded uh, leader. Uh, but most of my friends were somewhat disappointed. Uh, I would say maybe one out of ten say maybe the second five-year term he might still do something. But I think the dominant view is a disappointment that he has cracked down on uh, 
freedoms. Uh, he's now worried about foreigners control <coughs> internets. Uh, the foreign reporters are uh, very unhappy with him because uh, a lot of them are not allowed in, and those who are allowed in are chased or, or uh, harassed. Uh, and Chinese who talk to foreigners are, can be in trouble very easily. Uh, and uh, so I think the general reaction now of intellectuals in China is one of disappointment. At the same time, if, you know, I, I think that a lot of the Chinese who live there have, have learned over the years to deal with the autocratic system. And uh, so if you recall, some of my Chinese friends, I feel, they're told to do something, say something, they would say what they have to do. Uh, one of my American scholar friends used to use the word feigned compliance. So, you know, the, the leader says, say so and so, yes, you know, they, and, and uh, you know, they, they express their opinions, you know, that they're supposed to that indicate the leader, but they still have their own opinions. And my experience uh, this last time when I came uh, for a few weeks is if I talk to Chinese in groups of 10 or 15, they are often more cautious because somebody in that group might be reported on what they say to higher ups and some little political commissar might report it. But if you get a one-on-one -on -one or one or two with close friends, they have quite different views and they're very independent-minded. So I think that a lot of Chinese intellectuals, in my view, are still quite independent-minded and capable of thinking differently. Uh, and they don't think this will last forever. And uh, some are now saying, well, maybe it could change in the second five-year term. Some people say, well, maybe seven years later, after Xi Jinping is done. Some people say, oh, we're scared. He might try to seek a third term, and it might take even longer. So I think there is, if I had to guess the explanation, it's that China is now going through such difficulties because of the financial issues uh, and uh, because of the dissatisfaction about corruption. Even though they have a campaign against corruption, still exists and, and medical care and uh, old age security. There's so many problems that uh, I think the leaders don't want another, anything else like Tiananmen again. They, they feel they have to be tight and uh, to keep tighter control or things might break loose and uh, the country would be badly divided. So if I had to make a guess as to the various reasons you give for what, what is the most important reason why they are clamping down. I think the leaders themselves are very worried that dissension, uh, they're not so much worried about dissension in the local community because if they're angry at the local mayor or the, uh, the county magistrate, uh, that doesn't threaten Beijing. But you know, in the history, very often some of those religious cults that are linked one locality or another. Those are the dangerous ones. So Falun Gong is more dangerous because you have Falun Gong all over the country. So you worry much more about Falun Gong. You don't worry so much about when they attack some political uh, county seat. In fact, you can blame the county head, you replace him, and it doesn't hurt the change. But I think the things that reflect on the national government, like corruption, toleration, and so forth. I think they're very concerned about it. That's my question. Senior Chris, how did you first become interested in this teacher? Well, uh, I first became interested because uh, in my little town in Delora, Ohio, uh, Ohio Western, we had a few missionary kids who came from China. So they, in my class, in fourth grade, we had one girl who was a missionary kid uh, from China. And we had several missionary families that we knew that were a little bit that. But that had nothing to do with my going into East Asian studies. Uh, <laughs> I, I was a, I had a very unusual career that is, in a way, uh, bounded by my generation. <clears throat> when I was in graduate school, I was studying sociology and psychology. And, uh, I didn't have any courses on Asia, either as a either as an undergraduate or graduate. 
And when I got my PhD, one, one of my teachers said, you're so provincial. You never even out of the United States. If you want to teach about American society, you've got to go to someplace different. And she said, why don't you pick another country that's also industrial, fairly modern, but has different culture? And uh, another faculty member had been to Japan. He says, I'll try to get you to Japan. So I got a, a scholarship, a fellowship to go to Japan for two years. Then I got back, and I was still in the mental health field. And I went to see one of my teachers at Harvard and uh, said, you know, I'm really getting more into East Asia than I am. And he said, well, you know, we just got some money at Harvard uh, to help train more young scholars in Asia. And we don't have any senior sociologists. And, and uh, we looked around the country and we don't have anybody we want to hire. So we decided that uh, we'll give you a few years of training. And if you work out, you can stay. So in one weekend, I decided to become a Chinese specialist. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a rare thing in my generation. Uh, that, that is over because the next generations, you know, some people get started already as undergraduates in language or graduate students or they get over pretty young. But I started Japanese when I was 28 and I started Chinese when I was 31, which is very late. And I don't advise anybody to do it that way. But, uh, it took a lot of struggle, a lot of work. I'm glad I've done it, but I wish I'd had an opportunity to get those languages much earlier. That's what I feel. I have a question about the geopolitics scene in East Asia. Um, there has been ongoing territorial disputes between, yeah, <laughs> so you can see where I'm coming from. Um, there has been ongoing disputes about the territories. Um, like between Japan and China, the Senkaku Dayaku Island has been one of those. And then South China Sea, there has been a more territorial dispute as well. From your experiences in um, Chinese leadership, is there any concern that you might foresee the, either military actions or some kind of violence will, will be resorted as a solution? Or is there any any way, maybe the United States is opinion that they wrote hand for Japan, for the same couple of disputes that they said, Japan, right? Korea, Japan. What do you see the USA's um, position in those disputes against either China or support? I think that's a very key issue. It's one that really worries Asian specialists. And uh, I am worried that there is a danger of conflict. And the problem is that you, you have some air uh, pilot or some ship leader, and uh, he gets angry or makes a little mistake, you have a collision, and that, that leads to something bigger. I mean, if you think of World War I in Europe, you know, it was an accident like that that brought on bigger things. And that kind of accident could happen. I think that the, the top leaders now and the military who have meetings are trying to find a way so that if you have an accident, that it will get under control. And I think the leaders of the country are very aware that in a nuclear age, the danger of conflict is too great. And it's so out of keeping with our interests that we ought to find a lot of firewalls to prevent little accidents from getting bigger. So if I were a betting man and had to bet, I would say the chances of conflict are very, very low, very small, like that, because the higher-ups do have ways of trying to stop that. But it is a worry, and, then, and their accidents could happen. And I think we have to be very alert. And I, I, I worry about leaders in all the countries. I worry about leaders in the United States who might say provocative things. They'll get the Chinese so upset, or in Japan. I think Abe started out as a little too provocative. I think he's tried to pull his horns back, and so he's not being so provocative. I think Xi Jinping also, um, he, he was concerned about getting national unity. And so he made some strong statements about Japan uh, early, but I think uh, he learned that it's too important now. It, it uh, hurts your relationship all around the world if you were too strong on Japan. And therefore, without 
becoming really friendly. I think he's trying to take some steps, at least have some discussions with Japan, to prevent uh, the conflict from escalating. And the danger, of course, is that countries change leaders, and the new leaders may not be aware, and they may not uh, uh, behave in a, in a circumspect way. They may do things that are too provocative, and that, that could be a real danger. It's a real worry, and I think that the, the, uh, there are a lot, I have a lot of friends in Washington who work on Asian issues, and they're, they're all very concerned that uh, the dangers of conflict. I think the danger of conflict between Korea and Japan is not so great. I think they will, uh, they have plenty of problems, but I think they will keep under control. I think the bigger problem is China versus Japan and China versus the United States. That's my perspective. We have time for one brief question. just mean people with middle income. Some, a lot of people who talk about middle class only think of middle income. But what I was writing about uh, were the families of people who worked in large organizations and had a certain security in Japan. And I saw uh, a kind of way of life that came from a secure husband uh, who had a good job and where the, the uh, family had a fairly predictable life. Uh, they were not going to become super rich, but they didn't have that many worries, uh, and they wanted to give the train, the train children, so forth. <clears throat> I think in China, there's several things that are quite different. One is, it's a, it's a huge society, and you don't have that much job security, except through the government. Uh, there's much higher turnover of people and people talk about the middle class there as kind of middle income. And I think that, that the, the life in China is still uh, much more mobile. Uh, the people move to neighborhoods. They're much more concerned about money. Uh, it's not as secure. Uh, there's more crime. There's more problems of all, all kinds. And, in, and so um, I think uh, What's the title? Of some, some of my friends who are working on those issues in China talk about uh, sort of middle class uh, ambitions. You know that uh, there's a book by Evan Osnos on sort of the age of ambition in China, and I think part of the ambition in China uh, comes from jumping around and uh, making connections that you can somehow use, and it's a more mobile. You could say more entrepreneurial. Uh, you could say more aggressive, uh, depending on how you look at that. But I think it's a a looser kind. Of, of course, that's typical. I mean, in a country of 1.3 billion, you've got a lot of variety. But if I had this, one of the things when I wrote this book about Japan's new middle class, uh, I talked when I ran into a lot of people say, "Oh, are you talking about my community?" Because there's such a common pattern found in many different parts. Of I think that the salary man's life is what I wrote about, where there's a very similarity in a lot of different parts of Japan. But in China, there's still a wide, wide variation. And there are a lot of families where the kids, have, uh, where the daughters and sons have gone off. Uh, you had some of this in Japan, say the farm families, where the old couple was left and the young people went into the cities. Uh, and yet the uh, poor communities left. But in China, that's much more massive. They have so many families now, and one child families, uh, which is part of it too. Meaning that you don't have kids staying at home with the old people nearly as much as you did in Japan. So uh, I guess those are the kind of things, uh, if I were going in that direction, what I'm really trying to do, as I was telling my friends at lunch, is I want to I write a book about the long history of relations between China and Japan. In the hopes that I can 
help provide some perspective so these two countries can go on with each other, mm -hmm. which I think is so important. That's what I'm personally working on. But I, I'm sure there are a lot of bright young people now working on just the issue you said. Thank you very much.